So today on What's Inside, we're going to be looking at a garage door opener, and this is what you probably expect. It opens garages. And why is this one in the pin? Because this bearing here is shot. It shouldn't be moving really at all. So they're pretty simple. This is the bearing that does it. You got a few adjustments for how far up and down you go, a few connectors on the back, probably a circuit board in here for controlling it, a little antenna, a little wire antenna. I'm guessing he's running on the 2.4 rail. And then this guy here runs a chain, which lowers and closes your garage door. So, I've never actually been in one of these. I actually really have never seen the insides. never looked up pictures to see what's in them, so it's all new to me. I'm guessing there's going to be a small motor. I don't know. I'm going to make a bet it's a universal motor because they're just being cheap and don't want to put a nice one in. These are definitely not continuous duty. It's rated at a third of a horse, so if worked correctly, it should be around two to 300 watt motor. Um, definitely a bit of gearing, of which the bad bearing here is shot. I want to see how well they actually did that bearing in the first place, though. That's always fun curiosity. Uh, probably a basic couple of relays to drive it. Universal motors are great because you can easily reverse them, so if they're doing that. And then a little micro that drives that tells it when to go up and down. Probably not too much more than that in here. So it looks like the first thing to come off will be pretty much the whole top cover. I mean, looks like I'm still missing a bolt or something. Nope, no I'm not. And it comes out, it's attached by these wires that so goes to the integrated lamp holder, which is probably ran by another fuse. And from what I can see, it's not a universal motor, I was wrong, but looks like they just went standard two-phase AC induction, which would make sense here because they want a consistent speed. So here's the inside of it, and I actually have control now to go have it go up and down. So this here is the motor we see. Um, it stands a Chamberlain Group as the name on the motor, 120 volts, 4.5 amps, bit over internal thermal production. Yep, 70 degrees C, eh, a bit on the low side, probably handles more. Um, next thing we notice, that's what these knobs do on the side. So these aren't electric at all. There's no micro controlling these knobs. All these knobs do is it's they're connected to electricity, and when it moves, it moves this up and down to do it. So let's get a little demonstration going. So here it is going up and down, and as you can see, the motor here is spinning. It turns this big gear, and it's turning this little thing that once it reaches here and touches, it's going to stop. And then once it touches, the next time it will go the other way around to do it. And that's not the only thing. There's another, um, you can see it right here. Probably a bit better once it stops spinning, but it's a rotary encoder to know how far it's gone. I'm curious why it has both. It tells it the number of rotations by how far this is spun here. Curious to have see why it has both. So we'll take a better look at the circuit board in a little bit. And we see, yeah, this is the bearing here that died. Uh, there's a lot of force being put on a fairly weak bearing up here and this piece up here. So yeah, it's not great design. It's definitely built down to a price for that. Uh, let's take a better look at the circuit board, and then um, how do they do motor control. Big capacitor here is the motor start capacitor. Everything else seems relatively fine. Plastic gearing is generally not the best option here. They just cover it with grease to make it last a wee small period of time. So let's take a better look at the circuit board here. So it's pretty darn simple if you can tell. We got a few connectors. This one here goes out to the other parts of it, which is the um, speed and the sensor for if it's low enough. This guy here goes to the power supply, we'll take a look a little bit more of a look at that in a bit. Looking at the main chips, we got this guy here, which is a LM7805 5 volt regulator. Um, we got a quad op amp here. I can't find anything about this exact chip, but I'm almost certain it's a um, microcontroller. And then a few human interface buttons and stuff here. On the back side, it's pretty simple as well. We got this chip here, which is an EEPROM chip. That probably destroys the basic info here, which is interesting because they must have chosen a, a microcontroller that doesn't have EEPROM or chose to go external so they could change it easier in production or something. I don't know exactly why. And then we got a couple of transistors and SMD parts on the back. And looking at the relay board, we can see, we'll look at this more in a little bit detail, they are 24 volt relays, which tells us that the voltage coming is probably at least 24 volts from the regulator. And according to the transformer, it's actually 22 volts AC which is going to give you probably around 26 to 28 because it's unregulated. That's being almost certainly switched with no regulation of these three little transistors here, which if you follow the traces, go up to this guy here to control it, the microcontroller, which tells it what to do. 
Microcontroller also seems to do the RF, and mainly this is RF drive circuitry here that drives the antenna just sticking out here. Uh, 7805 is giving you the 5-volt rail, which all the other chips need, and that's pretty much it to a pretty simple microcontroller chip. It's a bit older design, mainly single-sided, yet it does have a mask on the other side, and that's about it. N nothing bad, you know, some of these capacitors, a bit more surface mount would be fine, but you know, that's what you'd expect. This is the power supply. Now, the interesting thing is I've gotten so used to switch mode power supplies that looking at this made me think for a second. But it's surprisingly simple. And as it's labeled, this does up, this does down. Up is bigger probably because it's just more current going through it when you have to go up. Versus down, they probably saved the buck getting a slightly smaller one. Here, this is the light. And as we can see, they're actually all fully capable of driving the motor. This guy's only 7 amps, though. Where this one is the full 2 horse or 30 amp rating. And it probably this motor, yeah, it's, you can't really test it, but it pulls a lot more power. Following the traces, um, this is neutral, this is line. They go to this transformer, go to a, a few diodes and a bridge rectifier, save the buck or two there. Goes to a capacitor and all the regulations done on the other board. We got a couple of diodes here to get rid of the voltage spikes to that. And then we got a couple of mobs around here and capacitors. And got a couple of little capacitors here, probably just to smooth out the AC spikes and a few other things due to the switching. So that's really about it on this board. These are very simple little boards. And here's that failure point, the bearing, all that gunk around there is the bearing that shouldn't be able to move like this at all. Especially visible on the other side, all that gunk and stuff is bearing that all got chewed up. It looks like it's just, it wasn't a ball bearing, which I should have done also. This here's a little rotation meter as this thing turns, the little gaps here um, go and tell it how fast it's moving. It has an adjustment for speed and how hard it hits it. I don't know exactly how it's doing it because it doesn't seem to really have any true speed control. The other thing is, this isn't turning the motor. This isn't in here tight at all. So that's interesting why they chose not to do it very tight. Now it did have no load on under it, but it's weird it's so loose. Let's end this with a bit of experimentation. So this is something you probably shouldn't try, but we're going to try just powering up the motor itself with nothing else plugged in. And we got a buzzing. So, the one trick with this is I don't know exactly how to click on the relays to get it to go each way. So I'll have to find that out. Oh, that's how you get it to go one way. So if you have just one pig plugged in, it spins, top spins towards me. And if I switch which pin is plugged in where, I'm guessing it'll go the other way. And it does. I can't tell if it's going at a different speed. Let's actually try this with a clamp meter and find out. One of those things I don't have is one of those point um, tachometers, which I'd like, but I can use it during power. So it's about 2.6 amps, no impact. And if I put some resistance on, eh, I can get it up. Actually, not very much. That's almost no resistance, though. So sitting at about 2.5 amps. And if we switch the pins around, we can see if it's spinning much slower, it should use less power. It's 2.8, so it's pretty close. No significant differences. Um, motor actually got significantly warm. Can't easily see in there. It looks like it has one of those. Looks like the inside, the rotor is a little, has some fan blades, but this is going to get pretty toasty. Definitely not a continuous duty motor. Also has quite a bit of junk on it, so get your hands just greasy. So thanks for watching this episode of What's Inside. Stay tuned for more What's Insides and videos and whatever I'm interested in at this moment.